get out of my way, Amazon truck. I'm on my way to the library. Greetings, fellow techno surfs. I previously made a video about the death of the American Mall and how that loss had a terrible impact on suburban communities because it provided a place for people to go. Now, that may not seem like a big deal. No place to go? Well, cry me a river. There's children starving in Detroit, Michigan. But the mall served a purpose far greater than just selling fast fashion and pretzels. The mall was a third place. You may have heard about the third place, especially if you run in circles online of those who gripe about the abysmal public transit system and our terribly underfunded railway, like me. Or you may be coming to this for the first time as someone who just stares blankly over the desert of concrete filled to the brim with traffic, your only oasis, a local Applebee's, and wonder, why does this suck so much? Well, I have an answer for you. Off Waldo in that shirt. Not in a bad way. Let's begin with the question why does everything suck so much? Why do so many of us live in these hideous concrete strip mall junkyards? Why did so much of America go from this and this to this? The answer is laws and regulations around zoning that had good intentions, but as with so many things, the devil is in the details. You see, zoning laws aren't all bad. For example, it used to be that you could have residential homes being built right next to industrial zones that were dumping things like toxic waste and poisonous fumes into the air right next to where people were living. So someone could put their hard-earned money into buying a home and then, well, someone else could come right along and build a glue factory next to it, thus destroying the property value of the original residents. Health and safety concerns are mid, but property values, now you have the city's attention. The first time this was addressed was in 1908, when the city of Los Angeles drew up a law saying that you couldn't build industrial buildings next to residential. This was for the most part a good idea, except for some strange reason, the city included laundromats in their list of things that were considered industrial. Now that's kind of odd when you think about it for more than 30 seconds. Because of course, a laundromat is where people go to do their laundry, a necessary and common domestic task. Why put something so frequently needed so far away from where people lived? And then you remember that most laundromats during that time were owned and operated by Chinese immigrants who lived above them. There's that devil in the details. This was not the first or last time that Americans would make their own lives more inefficient and expensive in order to keep minorities out of their neighborhoods. But the real change came in 1926 when the Supreme Court ruled on Euclid versus Ambler. This was the case that many sociologists and city planners can point to as the time when American city planning really went to shit. And again, it started out with good intentions. Okay, so here's the scoop on this story. The village of Euclid, Ohio was attempting to set up zoning and decided that they wanted the entire village to be zoned residential. However, Ambler Realty owned 68 acres of land in Euclid. Their intentions were to put up these major industrial factories on it, right next to the residents of Euclid. And the village of Euclid was like, no, you can't do that. So Ambler Realty is all salty about it because industrial uses make way more of a profit for them than residential. So they take the village of Euclid to court. It goes all the way to the Supreme Court and they lose. According to the Supreme Court, the state did in fact have the right to enforce the zoning laws. Even if Ambler Realty owned the land privately, well, too bad, so sad. If the state says it's residential, it's residential. And for the most part, this was a good thing. It meant that the citizens represented by the state could dictate where industrial zones were built and that corporations couldn't just put up a factory wherever they wanted. However, the ruling had some odd inclusions. 
For instance, saying that apartment buildings should not be built next to single family homes. That's a little weird. You know, because an apartment is very much a residence. I'm in one right now, and I do in fact live here. This thing can fit so many rental dollars in it. You would never believe how many. I need to move. What a strange addition to an otherwise solid ruling. It's, it's almost as if they were attempting to segregate low-income people from their higher-income neighbors. This ruling set off a chain reaction of building laws and regulations that have brought us to where we are now. Because having to put industrial and later commercial places where people worked and shopped so far away from residential zones meant that everything had to be connected by roads, meaning everybody needed a car. And because everybody needed a car to go anywhere, there needed to be more roads and bigger roads. And as the population increased, we needed more cars. So we needed more roads and not just roads, but parking lots too. So, so many parking lots. So for the next few decades, we built cities around the needs of cars and not pedestrians. And well, here we are. America looks like one big strip mall. Most of it's really ugly. And despite having so many cars and so much commercial abundance, we often find we have nowhere to go. Which brings us to the third place. The third place was coined by urban sociologist Ray Oldenburg in his book, The Great Good Place. The third place is usually an informal public gathering place where you can go to relax and socialize and build community. Oldenburg argues that the third place is essential for human well-being because it provides us with a sense of belonging, a place to connect with others and give us a break from the demands of work and home. He has a great lecture about it on YouTube and I'll put a link in the description. In The Great Good Place, Oldenburg describes first place as home. That's where you get to be yourself entirely. It's a place of rest and privacy. The second place is work, where you have to put on a social mask and behave in a professional way. What that social mask is depends on the industry you're in. Oldenburg identifies four key characteristics of third places. One, they're informal and welcoming. Two, they need to be public and accessible to everyone. Three, they need to be neutral ground where people can come together regardless of their social status or background. And four, they need to be places where people can relax and socialize without feeling the pressure to conform. You can see how a mall really fits the bill for all of these, though I have some additional elements that I would add going forward, but I'll cover that later. But we'll cover that later. Some examples of third places are libraries, community centers, and parks. Oldenburg also includes churches in his lecture. However, I suspect a lot of churches in the US do not meet the criteria for not feeling pressure to conform. But I'm sure some do. Not all churches. Third places are particularly essential for people who are more isolated and lonely, a distressing issue becoming more of a problem in a more detached and atomized world of late stage capitalism. But third places aren't just for socializing, they're also integral to citizenship. It allows a space for people to play a role in civic engagement. This is a personal gripe I have with our current situation where we spend most of our time as consumers rather than citizens of the country. So a third place offers this space for people to come together and discuss local issues and make a difference in their community. Take a moment to think about when was the last time you saw yourself as a citizen and not a customer? When was the last time your destination was a third place? In my case, I have to actively make an effort to go to the library because as silly as it sounds, I just forget it's there. Once I'm there, I love it. It's such an amazing resource, not just for books and movies, but modern libraries actually have an enormous amount of resources for people. My local library has a seed library where you can get flowers and vegetable seeds for your garden for free just like to plant. How cool is that? Also, librarians, kind of amazing. They're not just there to help you find a book. They can also help you do research, they can help connect you to local resources, and they can be a wealth of knowledge on all sorts of subjects, especially ones that may not have a lot of online information. I wanted to be a librarian once. Now I'm a YouTuber. Anyway, when the third place is lost, according to Oldenburg, 
This puts a lot of pressure on the home because now it's the only place you have to socialize. That then puts too much pressure on your home relationships, like your marriage, to provide all of the socializing you need as a human being, which is just too much pressure for any one relationship. You know, when I take this all into consideration, so much of my past experiences make sense now. Like being a teenager and having the big social spot be like a Wendy's parking lot. Or just driving. Everyone piling into one person's car and just driving to pass the time. Where should we all go tonight? Oh, I don't know, is the Walmart still open? And later on in my relationships, spending almost all my time socializing with one person. No wonder 50% of marriages end in divorce. Someone who understood the concept of the third place very well was Howard Schultz, the businessman who created Starbucks. Now, don't get me wrong, I never want to stand a capitalist. I'm just saying he knew what he was doing. In creating Starbucks, he wanted to create not just a coffee shop, but a destination, a place for people to go and socialize. That's why the interior is so comfortable compared to a place like McDonald's that wants you in and out as fast as possible. Starbucks has low lighting, inoffensive music, free Wi-Fi. It's why they have a single person bathroom with a heavy lock, all the comforts of home, but you also have a place to sit in public for hours and socialize. It's meant to provide a meeting space. And damn if it didn't work, the coffee is terrible, but you always know you're going to have a comfortable place to sit. The only problem is that you have to spend money there. It's the capitalist solution. A third place for a price. Okay, so earlier I mentioned that I had some additional characteristics that I wanted to add to Oldenburg's list for the third place. And a lot of that has to do with climate change. Because you know, a park is wonderful at certain times of the year, and those certain times of the year are becoming more infrequent and difficult to anticipate. A third place for a community can not just be a park if it's going to be 110 degrees outside or if it's pouring rain from a hurricane. As we move forward with climate change being our new normal, we have to start planning the future around the new reality that we must anticipate all sorts of different weather throughout the year. Is it gonna be 95 degrees in January? It might be. All future third places need to provide shelter from the elements. It's simply not an option to put a gazebo on a strip of grass and call it good anymore. Again, another reason malls were so great, it allows you to walk long distances and get exercise while also being in an air conditioned environment. Otherwise, you're just sitting at home in front of your air conditioner wishing you could go outside. Additionally, I think it would be important to provide people with access to nature. A study by Dr. Eleanor Ratcliffe, an environmental psychologist from the UK, found that birdsong can help regulate the human nervous system and reduce stress. And there's growing evidence that spending time in nature is just really good for people's mental health. Touching grass, man, there's nothing like it. And honestly, right now, I feel like most of us can use all the help we can get. This is why I propose we transform abandoned malls into public conservatories. Conservatories, you know, like in Clue. I was a victim too. At least my wife was. She had friends who were... socialists. Oh my god. They're like indoor spaces for growing plants and sitting around drinking tea and gossiping about Lady Kensington's new frock. I heard you can see her whole angle. Mm -hmm. Okay, take that, r remove the Lady Kensington's frock gossip and make it solar punk and you've got this incredible space for people to meet and gather and enjoy nature while also being protected from the elements. Yes, there can still be a Cinnabon, but imagine the beauty of using those enormous small spaces for people instead of corporations. You could have a library in there and a reading lounge and a cafe. You could have a big walking space for people to go on strolls and be like, oh my God, Lady Kensington's frock. You could have apartment spaces on a certain floor. You could have an indoor play structure for children to play if it's negative 15 degrees outside or 115. You can have concerts there and lectures and a community garden and after hours speakeasy for adults or an after school classes for kids. You could have a club space for people who play D&D and video game tournaments and plants, lots and lots of plants and a big fountain in the middle with a statue of blathers from Animal Crossing. Okay, maybe we'll vote on the statue later, but you get my abandoned malls are 
littering the US and are prime real estate for truly human-centered third places. These could either be an incredible asset for communities or just another place for a corporation to dump their Forever 21. The future is ours to decide. Thank you so much for watching my video on the third place. In the comments, I would really love to know what else you would put in this abandoned mall dream house I've concocted. I just put in my ideas that I thought would be cool, but I'd love to know what you would add. If you haven't already, please subscribe to my Patreon. That joke about my rent going up is not a joke. It really helps out the channel and allows me to continue making videos like this. Thank you so much, and I will see you next time. Bye!